Southwest. Now Samantha Smith with Inside Out. Hello and welcome to Inside Out Southwest stories and investigations from where you live. Tonight, after the Padstow speedboat tragedy, one man's campaign to save lives with a simple cord. Why didn't you attach it as you left? Because we were too busy getting all the uh, fenders yeah, off of the side. Education has failed. Now is the time for the law to back up the wearing of kill cords. Also tonight, the ingenious 18th century solution to a city's water wars. The trouble is, you've got to get this stuff all the way down to Plymouth Dock. And can unemployed Carl cut it in one of Paynton's busiest calves? One tomato catch, one tomato catch. I do feel a little bit all over the place to be quite honest with you. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm Sam Smith, and this is Inside Out Southwest. Speedboats, more popular than ever before, and more powerful. Boats like this with a medium-sized 150 horsepower engine can easily reach speeds of around 50 miles an hour. Might not sound much, but believe me, that can be pretty exciting. Boating's more and more accessible to more and more people, which is great. Um, it doesn't need to be an expensive sport. People can buy small boats, get into boating, but equally, some people come in and buy some quite large, fast bits of kit straight off from day one, which is equally good. But with power comes responsibility. Tonight, we're investigating whether those who govern boating in the UK could be doing more to prevent fatal accidents involving these machines. My son would be alive if the person driving his boat had been wearing the kill cord. May this year, and a tragedy on the Camel Estuary. The Milligan family were run over by their own speedboat as it raged out of control. Nick Milligan and his eight-year-old daughter Emily died from their injuries. Exactly what happened that day is still under investigation, but what is known is that nobody on the boat at the time of the accident was wearing one of these, a kill cord. Now this is wrapped around part of the skipper's body. If they go overboard for any reason, it gets yanked off the boat and it automatically cuts the engine. Hedden Johnson fears more lives will be lost unless the law is changed to make the wearing of kill cords compulsory. His son was killed by a speedboat 13 years ago in an accident similar to the one in Padstow. I saw that boat circling round in tight circles and it brought back the whole horror of Tristan's situation. Tristan was being given a test ride at the Southampton Boat Show. The person driving the boat wasn't wearing a kill cord and when everyone was thrown into the water, Tristan couldn't swim out of the way. The boat ran over Tristan with the propeller um, lacerating him, giving him fatal injuries. It's a horrific thought that he probably realised that the boat could run him over at any moment. And then seeing it approach, it's very hard to, to bear that thought. Official figures show an average of two kill cord accidents a year in the UK, with others which don't result in injury or death likely to go unreported. Hedden's joining Tim Stables on Foy's Harbour Patrol. He wants to get a rough idea how many people are wearing kill cords voluntarily. He's not attached. Now, I, I just noticed you coming in just now and you weren't attached to your kill cord. Is that something you do often, or is that an oversight? I must admit, I tend to do it as I leave the estuary when I'm doing sort of four or five miles an hour. Can I ask a blunt question? Why yeah. didn't you attach it as you left? Because we were too busy getting all the uh, fenders yeah, off of the side. That's a tricky thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I've, I've taken it off here because we were sorting ourselves out. Of it, but yeah. normally, 
you would normally be yeah. wearing it coming yeah, up and down yeah, the yeah, estuary yeah. because it's just as important really here because yeah. you you know you can't tell what might occur and you can go over for Hedon, it's a frustrating day. More than half the people he approaches are still not wearing their kill cords. Some people don't wear it out of bravado. I don't need to. I'm safe. I'm in flat water here. There's not a problem. That's what we've just heard down there. While Hedon's on the water, there's news of another rescue as a speedboat spins out of control in Scotland. The skipper hadn't been wearing a kill cord. If Tristan's accident, which took place in front of the marine industry in Great Britain, has had no effect, Kilkords aren't being worn any more than they are, were then, then it, it shows blatantly that education has failed. Now is the time for the law to back up the wearing of Kilkords. Keep aiming up at that lifeboat ahead of us and back to that neutral position again. Excellent, well done. But boating's governing body, the Royal Yachting Association, or RYA, really well is done. firmly opposed to any law making kill cords compulsory, even though its own safety courses teach they must be worn whenever the engine's running. Up here and then we're going to turn in a Paul Glatzel wrote the RYA's powerboat training handbook. I think there's a real danger uh, that an incident uh, like Padstow or elsewhere creates a knee-jerk reaction for a change, which is unnecessary. Um, if people do what they need to do and they do it right, m most of those instances wouldn't occur. And I appreciate we want everything to change overnight, but the reality is it doesn't always happen that way. Yeah. I mean, I would take issue with it being overnight. Like I say, it's 13 years since that terrible accident at the Southampton Boat Show. And we've just had this awful incident in Padstow. And yet we've been out and we've seen many people not using their kill cords. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. But we need to get a sense of perspective in terms of the number of incidents. Making it mandatory straight away would probably actually make no difference whatsoever. Nick Milligan had done the RYA's course prior to his fatal accident in Padstow. But Paul doesn't think the fact safety conscious people don't always wear their kill cords means a change is needed. The system's simple, it works. If you attach the kill cord, and there's no reason not to, and you fall out the boat, it stops the boat. There but it's a system that's been around for decades and the mindset hasn't changed adequately. Doesn't that suggest that the system itself needs to change? We need to find a new way of making these boats safe. Um, you can always come up with new and different ways of actually doing things, uh, but if something works, and it works very, very well. It works if people use it, and I think you'd agree that a lot of people don't. They don't use it properly, at least. No, they don't. Um, and that, we want it to change, I want it to change. We all want less incidents to actually occur. Surprisingly, RNLI skippers don't wear kill cords on their inshore lifeboats because of the risk they might inadvertently cut the engine in a dangerous situation. Some argue the conventional kill cord isn't always practical for recreational boaters either. The reason they're not wearing them is because um, you are literally leashed to the console, um, which restricts your movement. And on a boat, um, there's so many situations where you need to go to the front of the boat, to moor the boat, to the back of the boat, help people in and out of the boat, etc., etc., where you need to unclip. And basically that whole time you're open to to problems. And in those kind of situations it's not always possible to, to, to stop the engine? No, not at all. In fact those situations are the worst situations because particularly, just for example, when you're mooring the boat, you're messing around with ropes and you're walking past the console and this is the throttle. Uh, now there's a lot of boats now that are being manufactured where the throttle is so sensitive that one small knock and the boat's flying off in you know one direction. The people selling this new device think they've got the answer. The wireless coast key means the driver doesn't have to be attached to the boat all the time. There's a unit inside here uh, that it communicates with, and if it's disrupted, the signal, um, the engine will, will cut. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> time to put it to the test. Go, go. Ready? Go, 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 go. Oh, we've lost the skipper. There he goes. Still going, and there we go. The engine's cut out. Brilliant, it worked. Better go back for him. <laughs> the coast key is already being used on police boats in Norway. But the RYA says wireless devices are a red herring, a distraction from its campaign to get more people wearing conventional kill cords. 
Hedden doubts he'll ever convince them to support legislation. But he hasn't given up, and Tristan's final New Year message strengthens his resolve. If I don't succeed now, there'll come a day when they'll see the sense of it. I mean, no one wants to see people dying unnecessarily for something that can be avoided by an action that takes a second to do. Hedden started an online petition and is getting close to the 100,000 signatures needed for the chance of a debate in Parliament. A debate over whether it's worth sacrificing some of the freedoms enjoyed by voters for the chance of saving lives. These days, we're used to getting fresh water whenever we want it, but it wasn't always that easy. Nick Baker has been discovering the extraordinary lengths the people of Devonport had to go to just to get it flowing in the right direction. Plymouth in the 1700s was a very different place. It wasn't one town, but three. Plymouth, Stonehouse and Devonport, known then as Plymouth Dock. In Dock, they built naval ships for the Napoleonic Wars and business was booming. By 1790, the rapid growth of its population far outstripped its water supply. The town of Dock was dry. As the older town of Plymouth refused to supply water to the new townspeople, Plymouth Dock was forced to seek water elsewhere. It was a quest that led them away from Plymouth. Up, over the hills and high water. All the way up here high on Dartmoor, where water flowed then, as it does now, in abundance. The trouble is, you've got to get this stuff all the way down to Plymouth Dock. To do that, they decided to build an artificial watercourse, or LEET, that would provide the town's people and its industry with fresh Dartmoor water. Starting north of two bridges, it was to draw from three Dartmoor rivers and run some 28 miles directly into a reservoir in Devonport. Keith Ryan from the Dartmoor Preservation Association has tracked the entire length of the Leet on foot. So Keith, this is it, They've, uh, they managed to, yeah, to put it off? They did indeed. So is this yes. the very start of the Devonport Leet then? This is one of the starts, you might say. <laughs> there are three starts in that there are three rivers, the, the West Dart, this one the Cowsick and the Blacker Brook near Princetown. And each river has a Leet coming off it in an arrangement something like this. You, you basically dam up the river and you bring off a side channel but then you don't put all the water down the side channel, that's got to be governed, and you govern what goes over into the, the proper riverbed as it runs away. The construction of the Leet was a feat of engineering that took seven years to complete, and it wasn't until 1802 that water was finally running from the moor to Devonport. It's the longest Leet, perhaps, on Dartmoor. It's the great gift of water into Plymouth and Devonport, which, in, you know, without the Leet, they wouldn't have existed. There's no way you know, the other people could have survived. They need water to live. The Leet might appear to follow a meandering path across the moor, but it's a carefully selected route designed to keep the water moving downwards. Relying on gravity alone, it descends some 400 metres from its start point to its end. So, what is this? Well, this is where the water from the West Dart River and the Leet off the West Dart come running through down along uh, West Dart Valley, around this headland where Beardown Farm is. It's dropping about 30 foot, and the pressure from that is making it upwell here, and this is the Leet from the River Cowsick. So this is the upwelling, and it really is. It's features like this that made the Leet so successful. Feeding the Leet with water from more than one river ensured a steady water supply. Again, it's another amazing bit of water engineering, isn't it? Because there's yeah. some calculations involved in this. You get this wrong, it's a completely wasted yeah. effort. It's, you know, it's a good hundred years old and it runs night and day and there's no maintenance here. It works well then. It does indeed. <coughs> 
From here, the Leet flows down towards Princetown along the prison and then crosses the moor via Nuns Cross Tunnel. It then takes a sharp downturn at Blacktor before emerging as a cascade at Radick Hill. So you may well ask yourself what's going on here. Well, let me try and explain. Up there is the Devonport Leet. 